Everybody, welcome to System Crappers Live. I'm David Wilson. This week we're back with another Friday stream where we get together as a community and talk about whatever topic I've come up with it with. And this week is uh, no exception. If I can make my mouth cooperate with my brain. Um, first of all, I'd like to say hello to everybody who's here so far. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, Logi Ross, uh, Hader Mirza, Peter Tillemans, uh, Rostislav, Gio, Pavel, Mark, Benoit, uh, Simon, Alejandro. Hello, folks. Thanks so much for, for being here today. Uh, so yeah, we're going to talk about uh, Guile Scheme today. I've been threatening to make a, a video about Guile Scheme for a while now. And uh, since I hadn't got around to preparing a, an actual video yet, I figured it might be fun and interesting to uh, spend a little bit of time and give a run through of the language just to see, you know, what things people are interested in and maybe figure out what uh, areas I might be able to cover for a future video series or just a single video, just really depending on on how things go. So. I think it should be pretty fun to talk about it. Uh, but before we do that, I'd like to talk about a couple updates. Uh, one is that uh, next week, I'm actually going to try some experimental streams, um, but at a different time schedule than what I normally would be doing. So um, on Monday and Wednesday, I'm going to try to do some streams around 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. UTC. So that's uh, Greenwich Mean Time or whatever you want to call it. That's, you know, that's uh, sort of like around the UK, I think. So check your, your time schedule. If you're in, the, if you're in North America uh, or that part of the world, that, you know, whatever, whatever the latitude, longitude, whatever, um, then it might be nighttime for you because it's daytime for me. So I'm just trying to do something that is a little bit more convenient of a time for me because I would like to stream more regularly. But it's not something that, I mean, uh, the goal of streaming is actually to record myself doing some live coding that will, I will eventually turn into real videos. Uh, it's different than what I was planning to do before on the Flux Harmonic channel where I would do actual live streams where you could go back and look at the recording and it's sort of like a full end-to-end -end story, I guess you could say, or, or project. Um, this would be just plain live coding, no structure really. I have a goal that I'm going for, but we're not really necessarily planning to hit it at the, by the end of the stream. So it's not something that you would go back and maybe watch the recording for. So I'm going to hide the recordings of those in a playlist after the streams are done. Uh, but if it's something that you want to be there for, that would be cool. What we're actually going to be working on is some improvements to the, the scheme inspired programming language called Mesh that I've been working on this year. We started working on that on the Flux Harmonic channel, but since it's a Lisp and since it's the purpose of the language is related to what we do on this channel, I thought it would be more appropriate if I did that work and the videos about it on this channel. So if you're interested in uh, language design or how compilers are implemented, or just Lisp in general, and you want to check out those live streams, definitely come and join me. Um, we'll see if I can make it a regular thing. Like I said, next week is going to be a little bit of an experiment on that front. Uh, but the end result of doing these streams is that I would produce a video talking about the process of developing whatever the feature would be. And I think that next week I might start trying to work on continuations in the, uh, the runtime and the compiler, which should be pretty interesting because it's... Uh, a big change and it's also got some pretty interesting qualities so uh, definitely check that out if you're interested um hello to emmanuel samuel jackson Thokal, fade colt tv um colt tv says the only thing i would like for scheme is to be a lisp one i think that makes makes lisps more flexible well scheme is a lisp one hello to technomog nice to see ya. hello to totally not tactical uh, so I also want to mention uh, that I have a special code for uh, Mastering Emacs where uh, Mickey, the author of Mastering Emacs, uh, really 
uh, generously set up this uh, sort of affiliate code for me for his book, where if you buy a copy of the, of the book Mastering Emacs, which is a really excellent book on Emacs, goes far in depth on a lot of things that we haven't really covered in this channel, or maybe some things we have, some things we haven't, uh, but a uh, really excellent resource if you want to get deeper in your knowledge about Emacs. Uh, and he has uh, decided to help out the channel by do doing this affiliate link. So any uh, uh, time that you buy a copy of Mastering Emacs with this link, with the System Crafters thing at the end of it, uh, some small portion of the sale of that book will go to the channel to support the channel, which is pretty awesome. So uh, I appreciate all of you who've done that so far because I think there's been quite a few people who have uh, got a copy of that. So thank you all who have uh, who've purchased a copy so far because it made Mickey pretty happy, I think. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Colt says, sorry, I meant Lisp2. Well, if you want a Lisp2, you should just probably use Common Lisp. I think Lisp2 is, is not so good. We can talk about that another time. Uh, uh, Amulvedia says, uh, new, the new article on Windows on Mastering Emacs is fantastic. I haven't seen that yet, but uh, definitely anything that Mickey writes on his website that goes along with the book, MasteringEmacs.org, he has very, very well-written and uh, insightful blog posts about Emacs. So you should check out the blog, if nothing else. Fade says blasphemy. Yeah, we'll, ha we'll have to argue about that on another stream. Lisp1 versus Lisp2 fight. Lisp2 is the way and the path. I don't think so. I don't agree with that. But I'm more of a uh, uh, functional programming type person. I know that you can do functional programming in common Lisp, but I think it's different. Okay, so today, what we're gonna do, like I mentioned before, is a rough introduction to Guile Scheme. And I say it's a rough introduction because I have literally not prepared at all, but it's more like a conversation and me sort of explaining what I know about Scheme and Guile Scheme uh, to you and through the discussion that we have, maybe we can sort of uncover some other interesting things about Scheme and Guile Scheme along the way. So uh, this is going to be geared towards people who have some experience with Lisp languages uh, like Emacs Lisp or Common Lisp because I'm going to be discussing ideas that you might be familiar with if you know those languages or you've uh, messed with those languages a little bit. Uh, but hopefully it could be interesting or useful to people who don't know Scheme. So if you happen across this video, uh, let me know what you think. Uh, and if there's enough, enough interest, I'll be happy to create a video series or at least a single video going more in depth about uh, Guile Scheme and maybe Scheme in general. I think one of the things I would like to do in this channel going forward is uh, talk more about Lisps. Um, maybe looking at different implementations of common Lisp and Scheme, not to show how to use them necessarily, but to, to show how they are built and how they function. Because Lisp is sort of an idea. Um, there are many implementations of what you would call Lisp, uh, Scheme being a big family of implementations, Common Lisp being a sp specification that has lots of implementations. I guess Scheme is a specification also, but um, they are all different in various ways, and uh, there are different implementations for different use cases, and it's kind of interesting to take a look at all these, especially if you want to use them for uh, hacking on your own projects or maybe building tools for your system configuration, etc. Uh, we're, we're looking at Guile scheme, scheme in particular right now because it, it does have relevance to uh, people who use the GNU Linux system because, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and also because GNU Geeks, the Linux distribution that I use, uses Guile Scheme as the language for configuration and also all the functionality of Geeks is written, well, the, most of the functionality of Geeks is written in, uh, in a Guile Scheme. So it's good to, to have a little bit of an introduction to that language if you want to get into GNU Geeks. So uh, the, the kinds of things we're going to talk about, uh, basic language characteristics uh, and sort of just an overview of what Guile Scheme is and even what Scheme is. Uh, defining variables of functions, just really very basic stuff that you need to know if you want to write any code in the language. Uh, setting variables, which is uh, useful. Um, let expressions, which is another way to define variables, but it has um, its own sort of qualities. Uh, looping constructs and higher order functions. If you want to loop in this language, you need to know how to do it. And there's this kind of one of my favorite things about the link, well, about scheme is the, how looping works in the language. Uh, so we'll talk about that. Uh, interacting with the environment, if we get time to talk about that, we can do a little bit of stuff on how you do console and file IO, since if you want to you know, interact with the real world, you have to be able to do some kind of IO. Uh, modules importing and exporting. Uh, Guile has a module system. Um, the older specifications of Scheme before 
the version six of the spec, I think, did not have any kind of module system or library system. So uh, Gile has its own and we'll talk about it. And uh, macros, if we have time, we'll talk about macros and continuations. So we'll see if we have time to get through all this stuff. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. And uh, while we go through this, I'm gonna try to use the geyser REPL to uh, experiment. I haven't set that up yet, so we'll have to do it live here and see whether that works, but uh, I think it'll be fine. Uh, Karen the person says, maybe useful to check out Robert Strawn's SICL implementation if you're gonna look at different Lisps. It's one of the newest, cleanest implementations of common Lisp. That sounds cool, I haven't heard of that. Um, uh, Emmanuel says, my first encounter with Guile scheme was in reading SICP. Well, that's interesting. I think they use um, MIT scheme in that one, don't they? MIT scheme is another, well, I think it's maintained as part of the GNU project, but it's, am I right about that? Let's see, MIT scheme, pretty old, but still uh, maintained. But yeah, it's part, okay, MIT GNU scheme. All right, anyway, that's not really relevant to the discussion, but there, there are many schemes and uh, Dial's one of them. So first of all, let me try to see if I can get a geyser REPL up and running. Uh, let's see, geyser. Well, let's first, let's do this first. I'm gonna go into uh, guile.scm. Let's just try this. It's probably a bad starting point, but we'll figure it out. So um, run geyser, actually run guile. That's another command that you can get from the geyser package. And uh, let's, also, see if I can copy some configuration you can use just to pull in Geyser. Oh yeah, I can't copy this because it's using setup.el. But if you just install the Geyser package, like uh, package install Geyser, um, it's it's in the non-GNU repo apparently. So if you have the non-GNU repo set up, which is by default in Emacs 28, you should be able to install Geyser. And um, I don't think you need a special package for Guile. Not sure why I'm getting multiple others, unless it's because I already have Geyser installed. Anyway, but uh, if you install the Geyser package, you should be able to do the same run Guile uh, command that I'm using in the MetaX listing. And now it's set up a Geyser REPL. Hopefully, it's connected to this buffer. Um, so I said that first. Well, let's not talk. Let's not do the coding first. First of all, let's say what Guile scheme is. So Guile scheme is an implementation of the scheme language specification. So. The latest version of that is the R7RS, which is, I'll just pull the Wikipedia page. So, oh, okay, so it's, it's a redirect. So there have been many uh, versions of the scheme standard and R7RS is the latest. I think that Guile supports R7RS. A lot of scheme implementations don't. It's been around for a while, but there was some sort of disagreement about certain design aspects there. So a lot of the schemes you'll see are either R7RS or R6RS. Um, and the important thing to know about Scheme is that there's a core language specification that doesn't have a lot of extra stuff in it. Like Common Lisp has many, many libraries and functionality uh, described in the language specification. Scheme, on the other hand, is much simpler at its core a lot easier to implement if you wanted to actually implement a real scheme implementation yourself. Uh, but then for the R7 RS, there is like a, a larger spec that has more library functions and everything else that you might want to have whenever you have a sort of a functional, I don't know, as a uh, practical language implementation, you could uh, have a lot more stuff that you implement as part of R7 RS. Anyway, the point being is that scheme is a little bit different than common Lisp in that it's more uh, minimalistic in its core, and then it has a lot of extension specs that can add extra functionality. Uh, JBDY Dev, uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name, sorry. Uh, R6RS and R7RS are basically coexisting currently. Yes, they are definitely coexisting, which is not super problematic because I think that R7RS is like a. So R6RS, a lot of stuff got added to the scheme spec, and I think people didn't like that. So in R7RS, I think they just like split out some of those extra things into the large spec so that the small spec is Judy. Okay. Uh, 
So it's there, there's been a lot of interesting happenings in the scheme spec community, I think. We'll have to talk about that one day, probably. Okay, so now Guile Scheme uh, started because I don't know if it's, if it's because Richard Stallman wanted to do this or if it was sort of already happening, but the, I think Richard Stallman wanted to have a Lisp, an official Lisp implementation for GNU projects to use as an extension language for those projects. So like Emacs has Emacs Lisp and it makes Emacs very, very hackable, like we talked about a couple of weeks ago, um, I think he wanted to have other GNU programs have a similar level of hackability by having a really good extension language that you could hook into the C program that uh, that you're using so that you can extend it by writing simple scripts or integrations or whatever you want to do. So Guile is a language that's mainly meant to be an extension programming language for other programs, but it is a full programming language. You can use it on its own. You can write full applications. You can write uh, scripts. So you, it's, it's a first class programming language in terms of what you can do with it. One of the interesting implications of Guile is that it's meant to be used in the GNU system. So it's not a thing where you can build an, your own application and statically link Guile into it. Like if you're, if you're the type of person who wants to make your own program and pull in a Lisp implementation and compile it into your program and then distribute that program, I don't think you can do that with Guile unless I'm wrong about that. And if you did do that with Guile, then you would have to license your program as GPL because I think Guile is uh, licensed GPL. So one of those typical things you run into with uh, GNU projects. But that's not a bad thing. It just really depends on what your goals are and, and what you want to do. But um, as it stands, Guile is a great language. Uh, it has really good tooling, obviously, because you have the Geyser uh, package in Emacs that, interact, that uh, integrates very well with it. Uh, so you definitely can't go wrong having this be the uh, scheme implementation that you start learning scheme on. It's very, very practical, very powerful. Rostislav says, uh, MetaX Helm Info Guile. Yeah, I think we could probably just do Info Guile, can't we? Info Guile. Yeah, probably not. Info. So if, if you want to go into the info system about Guile, then you could find it uh, if you have it set up correctly. Guile reference. There it is. That's what it's called. We can pull that up here. So um, they have some examples here. Not really that important, but um, let's get to the actual coding part of it. And if anybody has questions at any point, please feel free to ask. <laughs> Case says, maybe R7RS will do it. I don't think so. Okay. So uh, defining variables and functions. Uh, this is uh, very straightforward to do in a uh, scheme. Uh, I kind of like the syntax for, for definitions in scheme better than common list for Emacs list. I used to say define uh, my var 15. Now, I think I just got uh, no completions there, did I? Oh, great, that's gonna be helpful. Okay, so let's see. Eval, geyser, eval, region, last ex S expression, control X, control E. All right, so control meta X. I think the similar key bindings that you would use in an Emacs list buffer also work here. So I ran that define my var 15, and now I'm gonna say my var and well. Control X, Control E. Yeah, you see down here in the echo area, it says 15. And in the REPL, I think if I type my var, it will give you 15. So when we, we've been able to evaluate this code into the REPL, then you can go to the REPL and play around with it, which is kind of nice. Uh, so that's defining a variable. I think in, um, in Emacs list, obviously you can either do a set queue with whatever variable you want to set some value. You don't have to have a predefined variable for that. You may not have to in uh, scheme either. Let's see, uh, my var two, 20. Okay, unbound variable. Okay, so we'll talk about that in a second. So um, it's a little bit different in terms of variable bindings in Emacs Lisp and Common Lisp versus scheme because uh, scheme is lexically scoped. Uh, as opposed to common list, which is sort of dynamically scoped by default, if I'm not mistaken. So um, the difference there is that lexical scope means that whatever you see in the source file, any variables you see defined in the source file are accessible. And also inside of a, like a function definition or any scope of the language when you're writing code, like a let scope or a function scope, anything like that. 
Um, whereas dynamic bindings, you can basically set any variable at any time and then those changes you make to those variables are picked up anywhere that variable name is used in the code, which can um, make for some very interesting bugs that you end up with in your code. I kind of prefer lexical scoping, which is one of the reasons why I prefer um, scheme over common list, but I do think that there is some lexical scoping capability inside of common list and Faye can probably tell me uh, in the chat. Uh, but it's not default. I think dynamic scoping is the default in uh, Common Lisp, definitely the default in Emacs Lisp. So if you are a programmer and you sort of know about these things, then that is one major difference between Scheme and, um, and Common Lisp and Emacs Lisp, basically. For defining functions, you actually use the same syntax. Uh, define uh, my func, and then uh, let's say x as a parameter, and then I could say uh, plus uh, x2. And I'm going to use control meta X here, bugger exited. That's nice. Let me just use control X E. Okay. And now if I go into the REPL, I can say my func three and it will return five. I think I'm still in a sub prompt. So um, if you are used to writing Emacs lists, you'll, you'll notice a difference here where you have to put uh, parentheses around the, the function name. You don't do that in Emacs lists. You have defund my func and then X. That's sort of how the function definitions look in uh, in Emacs Lisp and I believe in Common Lisp as well. So uh, Simon in the chat says, I think 90% uh, of Common Lisp code is lexically scoped. If that's the case, that's good. Okay, Fade says, Common Lisp uses dynamic scope for special variables, which is anything explicitly def var or def parameters. Okay. Yeah, it, it has its uses for sure. And Scheme also has some facility for something like dynamic scope, but you have to opt in. Okay, so Faye says it's lexically scoped and safe function definitions. Cool, good to know. All right. So we've defined a variable and a function here. Um, so if you wanted to set something, like if I wanted to set this myvar to something else, you would use the set uh, exclamation point function and uh, that's one difference between common Lisp and Scheme, or any other Lisp, I guess, in Scheme, is that uh, there's a naming convention for any kind of mutable function in Scheme, where it's, there's an exclamation point at the end of the word. Uh, usually in common Lisp or Emacs Lisp, you see set Q or set F or other things like that. Um, those have their own meanings, obviously, but in Scheme, this is the syntax used for setting a variable. If I were to go ahead and uh, run that. Did it work? Okay. And uh, my var down here in REPL. Oh, it says 15. I think I screwed up this syntax. I specified. Yeah, it's 20 now. So we were able to set that variable, which is nice. Um, now, that's kind of lame. I mean, it's obviously not very uh, interesting to see. So maybe we can start to do something a little bit more interesting. So we can have a function where we can use a let expression for defining variable bindings. So um, let me think, what's a good toy function to make here? Maybe I could just do some kind of recursive function. So let me just say find and uh, value and list, okay? So uh, first of all, I'll set up some code to call it. So find five, and I'm gonna put this in a list of uh, one, two, uh, three, four, five, six, all right? And um, we'll also use display. So display is the way that you write things to the console. I mean, we were gonna talk about console later, but you know, we'll just do this in whatever order it makes sense. So here I'm, I'm using the display function to write out the result of finding something. And if I go try to run this code, and it tells me it didn't find it because it doesn't do anything yet, obviously. So uh, what, what I'm gonna do is actually make a recursive function to do this search because um, in lists in general, these list, this list data type is a linked list effectively. 
So uh, fizz buzz. No, we're not doing fizz buzz. I don't want to feel like I'm in a uh, uh, coding interview. Quick sort, man. You guys are hardcore. So um, here's what we'll do. So in fine, we're gonna say if uh, equal. So equal is sort of like the more complete equivalence function. I think there's also like an EQ. Yeah, EQ, EQL. Is there an EQL? Maybe it's just EQ and equal. I can't remember for sure. I use equal all the time, which is probably not the most efficient thing to use. But um, the idea is we're gonna check to see if the car of the list is equal to the value we're looking for. And this is also a good point to talk about if statements, which has slight difference from what you see in Lisp or other Lisps. So uh, we can say here that we did find it. Someone asked me about Lispy in the chat a second ago, and uh, I'm using Lispy right now, actually, for, for this. So, in fact, let me clone that. So this is not gonna be a very good function yet. Oh, come on. Okay, so I'm gonna eval this definition again. Maybe I should just do eval region on these. Little CR. Okay, that didn't help. Maybe I should be typing it in the REPL. How about that? Let's do it this way. Then I can just edit it here. So we'll call find. Okay, so it says didn't find it. So the first value of the list, the car of the list, and if you don't know what car is, uh, car is the uh, venerable function that exists in pretty much all Lisp implementations that gives you the first element of what they call a const pair. So in a linked list in Lisp, uh, a, the list is built out of something called a const pair. So you have a pair of values, one that's the car value, the left value, and one that's the cutter CDR value, which is the right value. And you just build a list by chaining these const cells together. So the car will always contain a value and the cutter will either contain another const cell or uh, nil or the empty list, depending on which uh, implementation that you are uh, looking for. And uh, Jeff, uh, hey Jeff, uh, in the chat says uh, car equals uh, contents of the A register. So that's sort of like a uh, machine language thing way on, way back. And and D is uh, contents of the decrement register. So yeah, it's uh, some old school stuff that just leaked into uh, Lisp history. Uh, Simon says, I believe in scheme first is better than car. You're probably right. I don't actually use that one because I got so used to using car and cutter. Colt says, for the next simple example, you should generate a random signal and find the distance between harmonics. Oh, boy. Uh, Pavel says, car doesn't exist in Clojure. Well, Clojure does everything differently. Clojure we'll have to talk about someday. Okay, so uh, all this function is doing right now is just using if to check the first value of the list. So like I said, um, a list is made of const cells. So if I were... If I wanted to continue looking at each item in the list, what I would need to do is get the remaining items of the list and call this basic, basically call the same function on it, which gives us a recursive function. So in this case, uh, if what I could do is call back that function definition. Wow. I can't pull it back up. That's going to be really annoying. Let me see if I can do this again. No, not pulling out of my history. Whatever, okay. So what we're gonna do is uh, if, if we found it, that's fine. If we didn't find it, then what we're gonna do is recursively call this function. Uh, we're gonna call find, calling the function itself. Uh, we are gonna pass along the value that uh, was passed to the previous invocation and we're gonna call cutter on the list. So we'll get rid of this uh, didn't find it here. Uh, now, I can't just do this blindly. I probably need to check if uh, the uh, list well, let's see. Before I do anything, I should probably check if the list is a pair. So if uh, pair, probably have a win here too. Is there a win? Win pair 
there's another way to do it too, but when pair uh, list, then, um, and I'm, I, I, when I say pair, I basically mean list needs to be a const cell. If it's a const cell, that's all we care about because we can put, call car and cutter on it. So if we know it's a pair, we go into inside of this uh, function or this uh, body of the win and say if equal car list, um, then we know that we found it. Otherwise, we pull the cutter of a list. And when we call this recursively, then that's going to do the check for a uh, pair. And if it's not a pair anymore, then we just bail out effectively. Uh, probably should do an if. Oh, so I'm going to say uh, if. And then for the false case, I'm going to uh, explicitly return false. So if it's not a pair anymore, then just return false because we didn't find it at all. So now I should be able to define this function or run this function, I suppose. Let's run this again. Uh, it says found it. All right. So sure, we think we found it. We don't know for sure. Maybe I should actually uh, write out what I'm looking for and what the current value is. So maybe write here, I can use begin. And if you've used common list or emacs list, begin is basically like prog n. It's an expression that lets you put multiple things in the body. So what I'm gonna do here is display. I don't remember the syntax for display. Uh, let me actually just take a quick look at this. Oh, that's some data string thing. Uh, you can string, string append, okay, that's good enough. Is that gonna work? Oh boy. Um, there's some kind of format syntax. I think I have to pull in a module for that. So let's get to that later. So string append um, looking at. And now there's a number, I think, to string. Okay. Number to string. We're assuming it's a number at least. Uh, car list. It's a bad, bad assumption to make. Let's drop this down another line. Looking at number to string car list. That's probably good enough. I'll also put a new line here at the end. So that should be enough on that. And uh, what this allows us to do is just do this display first and then run the uh, the if expression and whatever the value, the result value of the last expression inside of this begin body is, will be the result of the begin itself. So anything we do inside won't affect the result, but the last expression, this if expression will affect the result. So we get the same result as what we would get um, before. So I'm gonna run this again, and we'll see what kind of output we see. All right, looking at one, looking at two, three, four, five, found it. Okay, so the function is working uh, correctly using um, recursion. And uh, Jeff also mentions uh, that you can use the new line function instead. So if I didn't want to put this new line here uh, in the string itself, I could call new line here. But personally, I don't like to do that because I feel like it's uh, you know an unnecessary function call where you can just put a new line in your text. But it can be useful if you uh, don't have access to the original string and you don't want to do a display with a literal new line character in the string. So I'll go back and run this find five again and we get the same output. Let's change the value. Let's try to run it with three. Run that again. It seems like it did find three correctly. Let's look at uh, eight because that's not in the list. And this time it looks at all the items and ultimately returns uh, false. So I probably should return the value that I found. Well, I guess I could re return T, right? So I have found it here. This would be another case where I could say begin and then return uh, T. Another difference between, um, okay, there, there's two things let's, let's talk about here after we've written this function. One is that in scheme, you don't have T and nil like you have in common lisp. You have uh, hash T and hash F. I think those are meant to, to be literal values, but I think hash ha usually has a special meaning in a scheme where maybe it's like a reader macro or literal or something. So um, the uh, if you wanna do T or nil like you do in common lisp or emacs lisp, you have to use hash T or hash F. And that can be a problem if you're trying to translate code between um, scheme and Emacs Lisp. Like once I wrote a uh, sort of like a communication layer between a scheme program and an Emacs Lisp package, and you have to pre-process all of your ob or your print output, your printing print output from scheme before you send it over to Emacs Lisp, so you can read that form in and just manage it directly. So it can be a little bit of a pain to have to interrupt between common Lisp and scheme, but it's not too too bad. 
Uh, Charles Smith says that returning the found value would also be truthy. Yes, it would be truthy. That's for sure. I mean, uh, basically what Charles is saying is that I don't have to return T. I can just return car list. And if you're uh, using an if statement, uh, the Boolean check, the predicate check would, would say it's true effectively. Any value. Oh, that's another thing to say. Any value in scheme is true except for uh, false and I think the empty list. So let's let's try this really quick. I'll go back to the REPL. So I'll say um, and T, it's true. Oh, I forgot to close a string, all right. So since it returns it's true, that means that the and said the first thing in the expression is true so that it returns whatever is the, the next thing. So uh, if I were to put in and false, then it's just going to return false. If I put in and five, it will say it, it's true. If I put in a string, it's going to be true. Uh, let's see what happens if I give it an empty list. Okay, empty list is also true. So everything is true except for false, um, which is interesting because I think empty list is treated as false in common lisp or at least emacs lisp right so uh slight differences like that can bite you if you're jumping between languages um i i don't really have an opinion on whether it's better or not I'm not exactly sure but maybe it's just that uh you you want to be more clear about what it is you're checking for so um you either want some value or false whenever you're dealing with boolean expressions uh, Simon says, what about guile reflectiveness? Is it easy to list all predicates, for example? I don't know. How would you do that in common lisp? Oh, Pavel says, are you the same Sherry who we were considering a bot? Yes, it's Sherry. Sherry showed up again uh, last week. Let me let me check the chat because I've been sort of ignoring the chat up until now. Sorry for that. Let's see. Ah, uh, Kay says, how do you pass the found thing into the string that is uh, fed to display? Um, I think you, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we can set it into a variable, but probably not what you're asking. Uh -huh. Yes, K says, I don't think you want list as a variable in the function. You're right. Uh, try LST. Yes, I should probably do that. Let's just fix that now. It's going to break something, but. Uh, don't bump, 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 bump. That's good. Okay. We fixed it. Check that out. All right. Try that on a circular list. Yeah, I can't do that, obviously. Karen says, updated GNU Geeks series. Well, there's really nothing to say because uh, GNU Geeks hasn't really changed significantly enough to do a new series. And someone else mentioned earlier, I saw just briefly in the chat, asked about whether I was going to do an updated Emacs from scratch. I already started doing that. Um, but I didn't really make too much progress. I had a different approach to it, and I think it just made it a little bit too nebulous. Uh, Pavel, don't don't block Sherry. I think uh, I, I'm curious to see what Sherry has to say. Okay, I think I'm caught up on the chat now. Uh, Alejandro says something about unspecified. Tectomatar says uh, we still need to build truthy and falsy predicate functions due to list strangeness. Ah, but. Yes, so Simon says uh, it has P, not question mark, but not always P is present. Okay, yes, that's a great question. So uh, it is a naming convention in Scheme that any predicate function ends with question mark. That's another thing that I kind of like about Scheme is that there are 
naming conventions that kind of makes sense. And uh, it's very easy to see things in the code for you know, places where you're using a predicate, et cetera. Same thing in common list where you have dash P functions and Emacs list also has those. Um, yeah, Fade says the same thing in the chat. Scheme uses question mark for predicates, whereas CL uses the P suffix. Pronounce huh. Uh, how deep can recursion be? I don't know. Whatever the stack uh, depth is, I guess. Uh, Alejandro says the unspecified when evaluating the function definitions refers to the module or to something else. Okay, so unspecified is a special value in, um, in scheme. Unspecified basically means that um, for the thing that you evaluated, it, uh, it doesn't have a result or the result is not specified in terms of the spec. A define doesn't have a return value. By default even like a define like if we were to do that define my var again if i were to evaluate that it doesn't return five so define i think by default doesn't return a value so that's basically how you say that something doesn't return a value you just return this unspecified value uh peter says and makes a really good point uh, with tail recursion there is no stack usage so limited by patience yes um one of the cool things about Scheme, which I'm sure a few common list implementations support, is that uh, you have a tail recursion by default as sort of part of the specification. You need to implement a uh, tail call optimization. Uh, and if you don't know what that means, basically it means that if you recursively call a function or if you, well, the simplest definition is if you recursively call the same function, then it's almost like writing a loop instead of calling the function again. Um, what happens is that the parameters of the function basically just replace whatever the parameters of the function were before, and then uh, it executes the body of the function again. Now, that's not actually how tail recursion is implemented in practice. Um, that's something we can get into when we talk about you know, mesh on live stream is not really in scope for the discussion right now. But in reality, so long as you're calling any function in a tail position, meaning a branch of an if statement, um, or the last expression of a begin block, or the last expression of a let or a function definition, etc. Um, as long as it doesn't store its result in some variable, then technically speaking, any function call could be tail it could be tail call optimized, which means that you don't consume stack depth at that point. Uh, Fade says the compiler will rewrite the recursive form into a serialized iterative form. I mean, it could be like that in some implementations, but at least in my language, uh, I just clear the, st the stack entry and replace it. Uh, Alejandro says we can't store the function in the variable. Well, that's a great point, actually. Uh, check this out. So um, let's say we want to find another function. Uh, what could this be? My map. Okay. So um, I'm going to find a function called my map, but this time I'm actually going to use a lambda syntax to do that. So uh, this is going to be a higher order function where I, you could pass in a function to it. Uh, let's see, funk and LST, okay? So uh, what we've done here is created an anonymous function, a Lambda function, and if you don't know what that is, basically a function where it um, doesn't have a name, but it just represents a first class function as a value in the language. So you can write any function like that. You can just have a Lambda and you can bind it to a variable because in Scheme, uh, one of the big differences between that and a language like Common Lisp is that uh, functions exist in the same namespace as uh, variables. So you can define a function by just defining a variable and assigning a Lambda function to it, uh, just the same as you use the define syntax up here. And in reality, this define syntax is just syntax sugar over this form. So it, define is just for defining a binding, a variable binding. And what you put in there uh, is up to you but it, there's just a little bit of extra syntax help from the compiler to do this Lambda implicitly. 
Um, so in fact, let's, let's show that as an example. I'm gonna make another version of the find function that just does that as a Lambda. So I can say uh, find X and I'll move this and say Lambda value LST and then I'll just move all this stuff inside of that Lambda, right? So now we have to find find X. I'm gonna evaluate that, oh, hold on. I'll evaluate this whole thing. Now, um, I'll go here to find, I'll put in three, type in find X, execute that code. It's the same thing. It, it's literally the same. And this is one of the big differences between scheme and common lisp. Um, some people like it, like fade, I think likes the fact that there's a separate namespace for functions. But in my opinion, it keeps you from doing certain things that are pretty interesting as far as functional programming is, is concerned, because you can store any function in the variable and just invoke it. Uh, maybe you could say that it's more dangerous that way, or you could accidentally invoke a function, but in my case, I, I quite like that uh, aspect of schemes design. Let's see. Igor says, your channel is the best, by the way. Well, thank you. Uh, Igor says, will this be up later on videos? Yes. Uh, any stream that I record shows up later in my video listing, but it may take a couple hours. Uh, Ives says, have you tried Guile Scheme as a platform for scripting shell commands? Um, I've done it for, sh for scripts, but not shell commands, but it's, you know, sort of the same thing, I suppose. It's, it's good. It's good for you for, for scripting. Uh, Fade says, Scheme does delimited con continuations, which are the scheme from uh, feature from Scheme that I covet. Yeah, so I don't remember the details on delimited versus undelimited uh, continuations, but uh, continuations in general are amazing. And also a foot gun. Tech Tomatar says, sometimes you, sometime you should try Elixir. Um, maybe. I can't remember, is Elixir based on Erlang? Yeah, Pavel says, make sure, oh, uh, Case says, make sure the recursion is in the tail position. This is the last thing the form does. Yes. Hey, Thomas. Uh, Alejandro says, so in Scheme, functions and variables are in the same namespace like in Emacs Lisp. Well, in Emacs Lisp, they are not in the same namespace. That's the reason why uh, whenever you do add hook in Emacs Lisp, add hook uh, after save hook, you have to use a symbol to refer to the function name. Uh, kill buffer. How about that? Let's just kill the buffer after you save the file. Um, you can't just pass in the, the variable or what you would assume would be the variable for kill buffer because uh, it's kill buffer as a variable would have a different value than what the actual function symbol of kill buffer would be. So either you are passing in a symbol with the uh, single quote uh, of kill buffer or you are passing in the hash uh, uh, single quote for kill buffer, which is effectively like calling this uh, function uh, kill buffer. I believe that's a special form that will give you the value of the kill buffer function binding. So um, it, it is different. It's not the same as in Scheme. In Scheme, you can just pass a function by name, and I, I quite like that better. Let's see. Uh, Judy Dev says, basically quoting it prevents evaluation of the variable kill buffer, though I recall hash is the proper way to do that. Hash is better because you're giving the actual value, the function as value, so uh, it doesn't have to resolve what the function is. <laughs> okay, um, what's next? I was gonna write another function, like a higher order function here, um, which I guess, you know, I've already proved the point about uh, Lambda functions, but um, this might be an interesting time to talk about looping constructs. So we already saw one way to loop, which is recursion. And um, that's basically how you're expected to do looping in Scheme because tail recursion is, is sort of a first class feature where it works in many cases. It is, 
easy to use tail recursion for many of the looping strategies you, you might want to use. So you could just have a function that calls itself recursively to do that and all is good. Uh, you can also have mutually recursive functions uh, which do require special handling because you, since Scheme is a lexically scoped language, you have to have the bindings for both of the recursively, mutually recursive functions bound at the same time. Um, Let's see if I can make an example of that. Uh, there is a form called let rec, which you can use uh, odd. This is gonna be not good, but <laughs> let's see what happens. This is the, the typical example you see for like a let rec example. So um, lambda x. So they, they say that um, you can do odd in terms of even, man. I, my brain can't process that right now. Let's see, uh, let rec odd even. Let's just cheat right right now. There's always an example of this because it's just a very common example. Odd, here we go. So there's a let rec here is even lambda n or zero n is odd. So this is mutually recursive, meaning there's two functions that call each other recursively. And sub one is what? So, oh, it's a unary subtract. Subtract by one. Uh, all right, so let's get back to this then. Let's let's just do a little uh, copy and paste magic here. So, or is there is a zero? Ah, there's a zero predicate. Excellent. Is zero? Uh, let's let's say n here because that's what we're looking for. N. If zero is n or uh, is wait. This is even. Let's let's just be consistent so that we don't get confused. All right. In this case, we say uh, whoopsie, odd, and then uh, n minus one. Okay. And similarly, we would have an odd function that does the same thing, which it would call uh, even. So these functions are calling each other. So we can test this out by saying uh, even five. So that's wrong because that doesn't actually work. Let me see, is not zero. All right, so there's a different logic for odd. Probably people in the chat are telling me that right now. Whoops. So it's and not zero. And then uh, is even sub one, okay. Let's try that again. And right, now it says false. Let's see what four says. Okay, so it seems to be working. So what's happening here is that we're using the let rec form to define two bindings, even and odd with question marks because they're predicate functions. And then we're putting an anonymous function into that binding for both of them uh, so that these bindings will exist at the time that they're being called inside of the functions. And effectively what this is doing is that the compiler is creating the bindings for both of these uh, in a controlled fashion so that you know when this body of the let rec executes, those two bindings will be available and uh, those functions can call each other recursively the correct way. Otherwise, if you were to try to define those both as uh, functions outside, let's put, uh, whoopsie, let's put, sorry, I have a kid, so I say things like whoopsie sometimes. What can I do? Uh, define even. I mean, this is obviously going to fail immediately. And the reason why is that. Uh, oh, come on. Lispy is uh, being finicky at the moment. I got to use control Q. All right. So if I get rid of that one. Um, now, if I were to try to define this, it's all good. But if I try to call even, uh, it's not a good example because I would have to do, the, do it both at the same time because whenever you run it, it becomes a problem. Anyway, point being, let rec is good for defining mutually recursive functions and it's not really useful in this case because if you bind both of them at the global level, then they're both visible, so. Jangle Stick says, apparently Stallman is working on Elisp again and changing it over from dynamic local vars. How's that? Emmanuel says, isn't even built in? Yeah, probably. 
but the point was just to show an example. Uh, Fade says uh, the mixed uh, uh, parenthesis and square brace and scheme is a bit confusing. Well, I mean, it's like that enclosure too. But I believe you can do that, right? Um, you can use square brackets. If I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong about this. There is vector syntax that uses square brackets, but yeah. So you can use square brackets in place of um, uh, parentheses in certain places just to, to make the syntax look a little bit, little bit cleaner, I think, to call out certain parts. Okay. Uh, I lag continuously says, seems like let rec is like let star. Let star is different. So let's talk about let star because that's kind of interesting. Uh, let the regular let, let's say I wanted to do this. X is five. Uh, y is uh, X plus one. And in the body, we'll say display uh, number to string Y. Now, what do you think is going to happen when I run this? Well, you're going to find out. Control X, Control E. Uh, it says unbound variable X. So the problem here is that uh, when you try to set up this binding, you're looking for the, the variable X, the binding called X, but um, the way that let works is that under the covers, is effectively converting this into a, a function invocation. So if I were to rewrite this, what it looks like is uh, lambda uh, X, Y, uh, display, let me just copy what I had here. Okay, and in Scheme, one of the interesting things you can do is uh, invoke a function directly. So, uh, oh, actually, no. So, five, we could say here. And since Y is uh, done in terms of X, you can't really pass that in. So, Because it has to be, oh, that's why, that's why, it's exactly why, okay. What you're trying to pass in here, uh, x, y, is effectively plus x, one, right? So the way that you look at this is, a let is just a sort of a syntactic sugar for a lambda that's being passed in values as the function parameters. Uh, in this case, this is saying for the y parameter to this anonymous function, we're gonna pass in x plus one, but the reality is x only exists inside of the function, not outside of the function. So if the code looks like this, where you have a lambda and you're invoking it directly by passing parameters to the call, uh, then x doesn't exist. So it says the binding doesn't exist. Uh, so uh, the solution to that is to say, let star, then x five, and then y is uh, x plus one, and then we can just copy this. Uh, well, why do I even need to do display? I can just return the value directly, right? Um, y. Okay. So if I run this, it will return six as expected. And I think the way that this is getting translated is you have uh, lambda um, x lambda. Well, it's basically the same thing again. It's a it's a direct invocation. Lambda y. Get rid of that. No, I need this. Okay. And here it's uh, plus y1, which doesn't look right. Actually, no, that's wrong. The body of this would just be uh, y, okay? So here this would be x plus 1, and then this would be 5. So if I were to execute this, it would return 6. So what let star is doing is basically creating nested functions so that the binding of the preceding variables gets created before the later variables. So uh, yeah, this maybe it's getting a little bit deeper into scheme stuff than what you expected, but it's kind of interesting to know what's actually happening with these things. All right. Uh, so that's basically let, uh, the difference between let and let star. Now let rec is different because it's setting up both the variable, the bindings beforehand. I can't do a translation of that for you. It's probably similar, but I think the compiler is doing a little bit stuff. Ah, okay, Jeff 
brings up a good idea. Do a macro expand on the let rec. Now, um, geyser macro expand. Maybe I can just do it down here. Let's go into the REPL. Macro expand. Whoops. Macro expand. And if I just copy this whole thing. Oh, tree IL. Okay, that's interesting. Let me see. Let's see, guile scheme, macro expand. I'm not using the right thing, I think. Need to quote it? Ah, thanks. Right here. Wow. Come on now. Okay. Can't even see it. Let's. Let's paste this in and format it. Okay, so I'm gonna select this whole expression and uh, indent S expression. Uh, no. <laughs> Isn't there a way to format this? Maybe a PP, maybe so. What about uh, Lispy format? Come on. E print. Let's go for it. So, uh, P print. I need to pull in. What about just regular pretty print? The PP. Every time I press up and down, I end up going in the history instead. <clears throat> Is there a format S expression? I don't think there's a, a command for that. No. So, okay, so there's a pretty print. Um, sorry, folks, this is one thing I haven't really used in Guile that much. There's a little REPL command for that. Oh, come on. Uh, yes, that's my fault. My bad. Pretty print. Oh, geez, come on. Killing me. Can we go down here? I'm gonna have to use the mouse to click on it because it's not cooperating. All right, nothing. Oh, there it is. No, that's not it. Anyway, whatever. Um. Someone suggested meta Q. I don't think it works. So this is an object, so I think it won't pretty print it correctly. But anyway, um, it, I see some stuff going on here. They've got some lexical bindings being inserted. Lambda name even. Yeah, okay, it's, it's too complicated to look at, so I don't know if we can really learn much from it, even if we did get it pretty printed. Uh, yeah, it does a lot. That's what Judy Dev says. That's that's for sure. Indent PPS expression. Let's see. Can I just do it right here? Yeah, still not working. I don't know why. Yeah, let's see. What else did I have on the, the menu for what we're going to talk about? So we've got through setting variables, let expression. Uh, okay, looping constructs. There's one aspect of let we haven't discussed yet. So we can do that in a, in a minute. Uh, Moomin says, make a video about Nick's browser. Yeah. Maybe one day. I've tried Nix multiple times and it just doesn't do it for me. So uh, let. Let has a very interesting property in that you can create a uh, basically a recursive function in line. And this is something that I like to do as a looping construct sometimes. So you can just give a label or a name basically to, to the let block itself. So actually, let's, uh, let's convert this um, find function into a let that loops. So uh, we're going to say let, wow, 
loopy the uh, lispy is is biting uh let uh find loop and then um value lst we, we have to set this up like a normal let expression so i'm going to do a binding form here so uh, the, the value we're going to look for is five I actually could rewrite the whole function as uh, something like that. Okay. Anyway, uh, value five and LST is, uh, what is it? Uh, we'll just give it the value directly or five. Okay. There we go. Clean this up a bit. Uh, now inside of this block, this find loop, uh, symbol is now bound to effectively a recursive function that you can call. Uh, if I were to put in uh, find loop, and the interesting thing is that uh, sort of like what you saw before with the normal let, uh, the normal let expression will turn this body into a lambda function with uh, two parameters, one named value, one named LST. What this is effectively doing is creating a local binding for the name find loop, and it just binds that function to it. So it's an easy way to just to, to it's like a syntactic sh sugar for creating a uh, recursive function in line. Like if you want to do a loop inside of a function uh, or just anywhere really without having to define a function. Um, and I think this binding is only valid in the scope of this let block. It, you can't get to find loop outside. So it's not like defining a function normally. It's just sort of like an inline thing that you can do where it can call itself. So because it's defined like a Lambda or like a function, when you invoke find loop, you just pass whatever values you want uh, as a result of that. So in this case, uh, value starts with a, va a value of five, list starts with one, two, three, four, five. But when we call find loop again, whatever we pass in as the values will now replace these original value bindings for the let expression. So if I were to run this, uh, it will tell me looking at one, two, three, four, five, and then found it. Uh, so it's just another way to do looping and um, I find that I use this pattern a lot in the scheme code that I write because it gives you basically full control to do whatever kind of looping pattern you want. But the thing is that it gets a little bit repetitive because there's always this kind of thing where you have to check to see, okay, you know, am I looking at a pair? Like if you're walking on, on every item of a, of a list, you have to check whether it's a pair and do extra bookkeeping. So um, for common things, you may not want to do that. Uh, you may want to use a different higher, uh, uh, higher order function but at least uh, if you wanna write your own loop to do whatever you want, then this is a pretty good way to do that. And I don't think there's any loop, um, looping primitive. There's like a do or something maybe in the scheme spec. Maybe we can pull it up. I'm gonna pull up the uh, R7RS uh, PDF. Uh, Ives Bode says, this is like loop recur, right? Yeah, it's basically like loop recur. Judy Dev says, named let seems really elegant. I like it. I, I, I like that uh, pattern quite a lot. Okay, so R7RS. Let me just see if uh, this is gonna open up what I think it is. And I'm looking for a loop. So there's iteration. There's a, a do. Um, which is probably just syntactic sugar. It's syntax, right? This, this is a, basically a macro. And it probably turns into effectively a recursive function or a name bled or something. But this is this is the other sanctioned way to do looping in a scheme. And I, I never really use it. I use this form of the, the named let because I just like it better. But this also is pretty useful if you just want like a for loop um, that has uh, any bindings that you want and also a predicate condition that needs to be evaluated. Uh, Fade says, in common list, loop is just sugar over go to, really. Okay. I haven't actually written a do loop before. Let's uh, let's just do that quickly. Kind of interesting to just check that out. All right. So do uh, we'll just re rewrite the same thing. So LST is uh, one, two, three, four, five. I wonder if we can even do this. Can you set vec? Yeah, you can probably change bindings. Make vector. And uh, is that, that seems to be an increment case. Hmm. Let me just check the, the syntax again. 
Okay, so there's a test and an expression. What does a test and expression do, I wonder? So, so uh, in this form, you have the variable binding name, the init value, and the step. So in this case, we could say um, we have LST. We have the initial value, which is the, uh, the list. And then for each step, what we want to do is, uh, can, I, can I use the variable itself? I think I can. Yeah. Uh, if uh, pair, uh, actually, no. Let's just say could or LST. I think that's probably all we want to do on that, okay? And uh, the next binding we don't need to do, so we can just leave the, the binding forms done at that point. So then you have a second nested binding structure for the test. And in that one, I could say uh, if uh, pair LST, is that right? Or just, uh, no, just call pair directly. And we check the test. I think expression must be the final things to do inside of the loop. So like the result. So I can just say display found it, I think, maybe. This may not work very well in this construct, we'll see. And then at this point, uh, as the thing that happens inside every step, <clears throat> I don't want, I'm not sure about this actually. Specifies a set of variables to be bound, how they are to be initialized at the start, how they are to be updated on each iteration. Yeah, probably it's just for very simple stuff. Each iteration begins by evaluating tests. If the result is false, then the command expressions are evaluated in order for effect. Uh, so this needs to be not pair. Yeah, so we want, it, we want it to end whenever, no, no, we want it to keep running when this is, uh, wait, what? <laughs> when a termination condition is met, the loop exits. Okay, so maybe this is what I need, I need to expand this check. So if, man, this is not, okay, so if, uh, if not pair, I don't know. I don't, this doesn't really seem to translate. Probably mean empty list. Yeah, actually, that's a great way to do it. So if the list is empty, I can't really dispatch correctly on this, though. Can you do multiple conditions? Or is it just one? Yeah, it's just one. I'm wrong about uh, this part. So what well, that part's right. So if the list, let's just do this a simple way. If the list is empty, then you need to exit. I don't think there's a way to exit early. Like if you found the thing that you're looking for. Anyway, it's not really interesting enough. Well, multiple expressions are allowed, but uh, that's only for this one test. In here, you see that there's, well, maybe you're right. Anyway, I'm not an expert on the do expression. I think that let's, let's move on to other things that are a little bit more interesting for this. So let's go to my notes. So looping constructs we did, uh, interacting with the environment. So um, first of all, Guile scheme, read from console. I think it must be very easy. read so if i this is probably going to be a mistake but let's go into the REPL and type in read REPL. okay so um thing yeah that's a symbol right so if i were to say uh read that's actually reading from the uh, standard input effectively plus one two 
So read will read from uh, standard input by default and will evaluate whatever that expression is, which may be not what you want in many cases. So is there like a read string? No. Textual IO, okay. So uh, the way the IO works in Scheme in general is there's something called ports, which is effectively a, a IO stream. In fact, I can look at it here probably and find that. Standard procedures. Uh, where are you? Input and output. Ports. All right, so there's input from file, output from file. Read care. Read. So read procedure converts external representations of scheme objects into the objects themselves. Yeah. But we don't want that. We want to read just a string itself. <laughs> Judy Dev says, wait, you don't want, want user input to be run as arbitrary code? What could possibly go wrong? Yes, what could possibly go wrong? Okay, read line. Let's go with that. Read line. Possibly unbound variable. That can't be right. Get out of this uh, super deep exception stack. Huh. Maybe because this is R7RS. What does R5RS have to say about it? Let's see. Um, give me the table of contents. Come on now. That's lame. Okay, so input and there it is. Click. No, of course not. I told you this is unprepared. Okay, ports. Actually, I was, should be searching for read string, I think. Yeah, read string is n apparently not in the earlier versions of the spec. So it must have been added, I would say probably in R7. Um, but you can do uh, read care. And I'm guessing that, let's check the Guile scheme manual. I'm sure there's some uh, library function for this somewhere. Um, one, no, nah, let's not do one web page. I know I should be looking at this inside of uh, Emacs, but you know. Ports, ports, textual IO. So we got to pull in this module. So this is a point to talk about modules, at least in Guile Scheme, right? Benoit says, can't you load R7? I don't know, maybe. Um, so there's <clears throat> a couple ways to, to use modules in Guile scheme. Uh, this is not standard stuff for scheme in general. This is a specifically Guile uh, formulation of a module system. So anything that you see in Guile relating to modules is its own thing. Also, this name Ice9 is, uh, you know, every time I used to see that before, I'm like, what is Ice9? I think it stands for something, but it's I think it's like standard implementations of certain uh, features. Maybe it's for uh, surfies, which I didn't really describe before, but maybe I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, so let's uh, let's pull that in. So we're gonna use the use modules form, uh, loading modules. And I think you can do this anywhere, basically. So I'm gonna load up uh, this Ice Nine Textual Ports module from Guile Scheme using the use modules form, and uh, you can give it, I think, multiple uh, module names. Let's see, Ice Nine. Oh, okay, this gives us some extra stuff like command line, documentation, exceptions. This is all coming from Geyser. So if you have a Geyser REPL up, you get some nice uh, completions for things. So I can I can pull in multiple things if I want to. Um, and evaluate that again to make sure all these are pulled in. That's great. So now I can use the functions here. Read string, string, unget string, maybe get string. I see. Get string in. It sounds like it's uh, to get a certain number of characters. So let's try get get uh, string in. And uh, input port probably is bound to standard I.O. by default. So um, display. Just do this. Uh, string append. This is not code. And 
Drop this in there as well. Now, I'm going to copy this to the REPL to run it. Wrong number of arguments. Maybe it does want the port, after all. Oh, I need the, the count, also. Standard. No. St yeah, okay. Uh, current... What is the current port? Current port. So anyway, you have to specify a port, uh, apparently. Let's go to input and output, and let's see if we can find where the, uh, the ports are. Oh, wait, a standard. Port types. Take a look at that one. One? I don't think one will work. Ports on an operating system file, open file, file name, uh, standard. Man, SDDIO? Okay. Dial scheme. Standard in. Port. What is it? Default ports. Standard input. Okay, initially this is the standard input. Current input port. How about that? Many of these functions, we'll just uh, look this up in the, uh, the current dynamic scope. So I don't know why I'm having to, to specify this, but let me just put 20 here. I'm gonna run this again. Wrong argument in position one. Expecting open input port. Okay, so what is current input port at this? Ah, uh, is this the REPL? Fantastic. Okay, well, at any rate, that's what's supposed to happen. If I were to put that in a script and run it, I think it would work. Kind of interesting. Uh, Alejandro says, why is IO so weird in Scheme? It's, well, it's supposed to be more like a functional language where, so let, let's, let's give another example. How about this? Let's uh, read a file. So um, there are some functions we saw in, let's look at the scheme spec. I mean, you could use the guile functions too, but let's look at what the, the scheme spec has. So you can call open input file it to get a port and then read from that, that's all good. Uh, but the thing that you typically do is um, with input from file, uh, with input from file, okay? And, uh, you give a file name. I'm gonna use guile.scm, let's just read the file itself. And then you pass in what they call a thunk, which is basically a Lambda function with no parameters uh, so that it can be executed. Uh, a macro would be nice to make it so you don't have to do the, uh, the Lambda explicitly, but whatever. So now I think I could do like a read string. Let's see. Um, I read part of the file, display, uh, get string in. Ah, current uh, input port 20. Let's run this. Still the same. Wrong type argument. Expecting open input port. It's supposed to set input port. See? With input from file, the file should already exist. The file is open for input or output, and input or output port connected to it is made the default value returned by current input port. Oh, that's a function. Thanks. That's why I'm, I'm having trouble here, because I'm uh, making stupid mistakes. Boom, there it is. All right, so we did read some stuff. Yeah, just the define my var at the top of the file. Thanks, Jeff, for catching that. So I think that the thing that we were doing before also should possibly work, but let's not let's not play with that. So anyway, the, the point being that input is a little bit different than what you might be expecting, but um, the I I don't know like guile scheme dynamic scope. Sometimes there is dynamic environment. Okay, dynamic binding. Fluids and dynamic states. 
A fluid is a variable whose value is associated with the dynamic extent of a function call. So apparently they're not using fluids for that. And I don't believe that the scheme spec has anything about fluid or, let's see, dynamic. A dynamic wind is something different. Ah, they they do mention dynamic extent. Though. Oh, that's regarding continuation. Uh, Fade says, Haskell needs a monad just to trick itself into doing IO, and Benoit says IO monad is like the fourth dimension. Yep. Uh, Fade says, you need to keep the variables enclosed in a function alive for the extent of the function. Yeah. Okay, anyway, let's not talk about dynamic scoping right now, because clearly I don't uh, use it, and I uh, have not thought too much about it. But I'm guessing that this is probably using some kind of dynamic scoping or some kind of global variable under the covers to determine what the current import input port is. So uh, you're able to get whatever that is by calling current input port and this with input from file sets current input port to this file whenever you're inside the body of this Lambda. So that's just what you what you need to know on that. Uh, uh, Mousex says uh, parameterize and make parameter in R7RS. Interesting. Where is that? Let's see. Uh, parameterize. Let's see. Because I've not heard about this. Oh, parameterize uses, uses dynamic wind to dynamically rebind the associated value. Okay. So they're just giving you the macro implementation. Let's go back to my notes. Um, so modules importing and exporting. Uh, let's let's take a look, real, real quick look at how you define a module inside of a Guile scheme because that's something that's specific to Guile. Uh, Guile scheme modules. Pavel says, every function is pure if the universe is input. That's true. Ah, I should have done the creating Guile modules one. Because we want to see how a module is defined. I mean, importing one is pretty easy. There's a different syntax for importing as well. But um, you can also use define module to define a module. So if I were to go at the top of this file and say define module... Um, system crafters uh, guile demo and uh, yeah it, it basically creates a module right there I can just you know set that up and then any binding that I make inside of this module is um, REPL is a uh, part of that module effectively now there's a way to export symbols because I think they're not exported by default. Uh, you can export symbols uh, inside of a module definition by using this uh, hash colon export. So if I wanted to export this find function from this module, I can say um, export, and I think it's a list of symbols, um, find, right? What else do I have? Not find loop, I have find X. So I can have find and uh, find X. Evaluating this may not work. Okay, it worked somehow. You just replace it with a new copy. Yay, multiverse. Yes. Yeah, uh, pure functional coding. I don't know how easy that is to do in the world of Lisp because the environment itself is mutable. So the functions themselves can be pure. Uh, Jeff says, defining a module expects the code to be in a folder structure that mirrors the module definition, in this case, uh, System Crafters Guile Demo. Yes, you want to actually define modules that can be resolved. Uh, and in a file system, you would have to have a folder structure that mirrors the uh, module path. And then to make Guile be able to load that, you need to add that path to your load path. Um, if you use Emacs and you've kind of added your own folder of uh, Emacs files to Emacs using add to load path, and you probably are aware of what I'm talking about. Okay. 
So uh, that's exporting. I think you can also import specific bindings from uh, a module. Let's see, import. There is there is an import syntax using Gal modules. Import. Oh, there's I think use module has another syntax also. Uh, Guile use module because you see it a lot in Gile, uh, Geeks configuration code. Module system reflection. Uh, yes, uh, Benoit makes a good point. You can use uh, uh, percent sign load dash path to see what's in the load path. You can see what my load path looks like, which is kind of ugly because it's geeks and we have all the store paths that have uh, SHA-256 hashes in the file path. What else is inside the percent variable listing? A lot of stuff. You can just sort of uh, cruise through what these variables are to see more things. Library dear. Lots of things you can play around looking at. Uh, Judy Dev says, well, you could do func a pure functional programming in Lisp, C, any language really just depends on how much discipline you have. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It's it's difficult to do pure, pure functional programming, but if you use a language like uh, Clojure or uh, even like, you know, OCaml then, or Haskell, then you really understand what it means to write uh, pure functional code. It's not easy. But it's also much cleaner and uh, easier to reason about. Um, let's look at my geeks config because that will show us some good examples of imports. So dot files, David will systems common. So this is a defined module where I'm defining a module and I'm using this uh, colon, sorry, uh, hash colon use module to pull in uh, these various different modules. So it, as part of a module declaration, you can do imports, but you can also just use use modules that we saw before anywhere. So a little bit different. Okay, so we got about 15 minutes left. Let me see what else I had to talk about. So macros. Uh, macros in Scheme vary depending on which uh, implementation you're using. Uh, the Scheme specification only talks about something called defined syntax. As it probably shows up all over the place here. Let me see if I can find the right place where it is. Okay, syntax definition. So syntax definitions have this form. Now, let me tell you what um, is different about Scheme macros compared to uh, Common Lisp or uh, Emacs Lisp. Def macro in Common Lisp or Emacs Lisp is something called an unhygienic macro, which means that you're basically just giving a list of code that is probably back quoted and has things evaluated inside of it to then be uh, evaluated. It returns an expression, which is supposed to be code, and then that the compiler just takes that and evaluates it directly. And uh, the problem with that is if you are not careful about how your macro code gets generated, then you might start uh, using or setting values with a particular name that are in the scope where the macro gets used. Uh, and that's what they mean by the term unhygienic. So effectively, you're, you're generating code that could potentially uh, cause problems in the place where it gets used. Now, there are ways to deal with that. Uh, there's something called GenSim in, uh, in Common Lisp. I don't know if they have that in, okay, Guile Scheme has it. So if you call GenSim uh, test, then it will generate a unique symbol name for you that does not exist in the current environment or the global environment even, I guess. Uh, it's pretty much certain not to exist already. So if you use gen sims inside of your macro code, like if you're trying to define variables in a let expression or something else, then you have a greater chance of your code not having problems. But it's not good to do, have to do this because it's easy to forget and you might run into other problems, especially if you're using the same macro recursively. So um, it's generally considered not as safe as using something called a hygienic macro. Now, hygienic macros are different in that it's more like a template you can see def macro as like a template for code, but 
define syntax is literally a template for code. Uh, it's a bit harder to write because you don't have as much flexibility. It's, um, well, in my, in my limited experience writing def define syntax macros, uh, it is a bit harder to, to write the same kind of things you would do with def macro because def macro, you can just do whatever you want. Uh, but with define syntax, you don't have to worry at all about uh, name bindings because I think that um, there are some assumptions that are made about what you pass in that they should, the bindings should be correct already, I think. Let me see if anybody is giving some extra context in the chat. <clears throat> so let's just see what the spec says about it. Uh, keyword is an identifier for the name of the macro effectively. Uh, Judy Dev says, Guile also has defined syntax rule to help with the syntax of defined syntax. That's interesting. Uh, and uh, Case says, uh, Guile ha I think Guile has defined macro. Yeah, a lot of, well, I know of a few scheme implementations that have def macro. So you can use it. I mean, sometimes def macro is just the easiest way to get something done. And I, I'm not against def macro, but, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting to think about how to use define syntax correctly. Um, like variable definitions, syntax definitions can appear at the outermost level or nested within a body, which is kind of interesting. You can have a, a, a macro that only exists inside of a function if you want. If the defined syntax occurs at the outermost level, the global syntax environment extended, blah, blah, blah. Um, so in, there's showing an example here. Inside of a let, you can define a macro. Define syntax swap. So this is a pretty good example, I think. Uh, syntax rules. There's nothing in the in this parameter list here. I'm not exactly sure what that means. Uh, swap A, B. So what we're doing here is basically defining a template for the code. Uh, there's, there's a syntax called swap exclamation point. There is an A and a B. Those are the two parameters. And this is the code that should come out of it. So we're saying let temp A, we're creating a variable called, or a yeah, local binding called temp. Then we're just swapping the, the values of A and B. But here we're calling swap with X and Y. So effectively what's happening is that the uh, symbol for X and the symbol for Y get put into the place of where A and B are getting used here. So you've specified what the name of the symbol is and it's correct in the current lexical scope. And then that basically just gets passed into this template or this code that gets that swap gets expanded into, which is this uh, let expression. So I think that's the reason why it's safer from a uh, binding perspective is because you're just passing in the symbols you wanted to use. Now, I don't know what that means for generating new symbols based on a name. Um, that's something I haven't really looked into with defined syntax, but uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, macros can expand into definitions in any context text that, per that permits them. However, it's an error for definition to define an identifier whose binding has to be known in order to determine the meaning of the definition itself. And uh, Fade does make a good point. If I recall, defined syntax wasn't added until recent scheme history. There was something else before, right? What came before defined syntax? There was like syntax case or something, I think. Scheme, uh, syntactic extension. Let's see what the C2 wiki says. No, not helpful. Yes, let's see. It wasn't obvious that hygienic macros were possible. Yeah. Syntax case is totally different, case says. Anyway, I'm not clear on the history of uh, defined syntax, etc. Um, let's get back to the spec here. Let's see what they have here. Oh, define, define three. Well, yeah, of course that's a problem. Syntax ACDW. So you can define syntax rules in line. Oh, with let syntax, sure. They don't really go into very much detail here, for sure. 
uh, define syntax. Let's see some examples of define syntax. There's a few of them inside of uh, the spec. So here's an example of defining the cond macro, um, which you're probably familiar with uh, if you've written a lot of Lisp code, as a result of uh, using define syntax and syntax rules. So I think, are these like special symbols that could exist inside of the body here? But um, effectively what you're doing is, is writing a template. So you have cond and uh, else result one, result two. And then when you have result one, result two, and this dot, 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 there could be many results, I think. So this dot, dot, dot actually has special meaning in defined syntax. And I'm not fully clear on that because I haven't, I'm not an expert in defined syntax. I'm more of a def macro kind of person. Um, so uh, for cond, where you have else result one, result two, it turns it into a begin block without the else. So I think we're saying like cond with, uh, with a sub form of else result one, result two, right? Then, so cond with uh, test and result, let temp test if temp, is this visible? I need to zoom in on this. Let me zoom in. Temp test. So test is an expression that we are uh, binding into a variable called temp in a uh, nested let. If temp, then result is the result form. Okay, the arrow is basically a, an implicit function that uh, has a binding for this temp. Yeah, and it passes it in. Okay. Then there's contest uh, clause one, clause two. It checks the test. If temp, return temp, otherwise return the, the, the result of the, oh, it, it does, okay. So you can do like recursive um, calls, which is sort of how this works. You can recursively call the same syntax. Yeah, I'm starting to understand now a little bit more. It's, it's, it's weird. If you wanna do a more complicated syntax, you have to rec recursively call the syntax rule itself, but you're passing through the, the parts of the syntax that you saw here. So this is a rule where clause one, clause two are just things that are in sequence inside of this form. Then you can recursively call it with clause one, clause two. And uh, then where is it? It must be, it must be one just for, for the clauses. Test, cond test. Yeah, that's not what we're looking for. Test result one, result two. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. That is the this this is sort of like the top level, right? Because um, maybe that's that maybe that's the looping form. So anyway, point being, define syntax is harder to wrap your mind around. If you have to make a more complicated syntax, then you have to think recursively in terms of how you can apply the syntax and to, to hit all the rules. Like I said, I'm no expert on it, but def macro is way easier, <clears throat> excuse me, way easier to use whenever you're trying to define macros. Um, I, I want to actually figure this out to the extent that I know it really well so I can write this kind of macro system in my own language, but right now I, I don't have that level of understanding. Why aren't we talking about CSV in the chat? Uh, Fade says, let's define a CSV parser in Scheme. I suppose you could do that. <clears throat> or like a reader macro. Yeah. Peter says, CSV is a never-ending source of uh, exceptions and frustration. Anyway, okay. So continuations. We didn't really get a chance to talk about continuations, but I highly recommend you look up what continuations are. I'll tell you a little bit uh, about it, just because I find them to be very interesting. I don't know who's ringing my doorbell right now. Sorry about that noise. So, um, 
A continuation is basically a function that accepts the result of a previous expression and then executes the remaining part of the computation. And that sounds kind of vague because it is vague because it's basically a computational, well, it's an evaluation model. And um, what it allows you to do if you have first class continuations like Scheme does is it allows you to use a function to get a handle on the current continu continuation. Basically, if you, if you think of the program you're running and the function you're calling as having a call stack where when you keep calling functions, you're building up the stack of function calls. So at the point where, where you're currently executing your code in Scheme, you can call this call CC function and that will return to you a function representing your current position in what is effectively the call stack. And then once you have that, you can pass that to any other function. And then that function can invoke your continuation function to then jump back to that point in your call stack effectively, and then continue executing with that result variable. So um, the interesting thing about that is that it allows you to implement whatever kind of control structure you want. Like if you like to use channels like in Go or like what Clojure has, where you have uh, sort of different functions that are communicating with each other seemingly asynchronously, it's more like concurrently. Um, you can implement that with call CC and scheme because you have the ability to do your own sort of lightweight scheduling. Whenever you have a function that hits call CC and pass it to something else, then you can sort of defer the rest of the execution of something until another function calls that. So it's, uh, yeah, Rostislav says, uh, call CC is like a high level go-to. It's like a very superpower go-to. Um, and uh, Fade also mentions a good point, which is, it's incredibly useful when you have a continuing process in a lot of uh, enclosing state, especially if you want to do like an early escape. Uh, if you have like a, a binary search function where you're trying to, to find a particular value in that binary tree, it's very easy to use a continuation to just jump back out. And a lot of languages have a way to do that um, with some kind of syntax feature. But in Scheme, you have the ability to invent your own syntax and uh, functionality for that with call CC. It's kind of interesting. Alejandro says, what's the difference between Guile and Racket? Emacs asks for an implementation when I open an SCM file. Racket is another scheme implementation, but Racket is more meant for being sort of like a language creation toolkit, I think. It's a scheme implementation. It's actually uh, built on Shea Scheme. Let's, let me type that out. I think that's how you pronounce Shea Scheme. And uh, Racket is built on that now. So it is a scheme. Uh, but it also has a lot more functionality for defining other language syntaxes. So, and it's also a very rich environment. So it's pretty good, actually. If you want to learn Scheme, you can't go wrong with, uh, with using Racket for that. I haven't really used Racket that much, though. Uh, Fade says, you can model a web flow through a series of forms using the evalu this evaluation model. Yeah, there's a lot of really cool stuff you can do. Um, I think that you can probably do some really interesting things with uh, UI uh, development libraries like if you were to use continuations to do sort of how you would deal with like you know button events or any kind of events in a ui system uh continuations would be a very interesting way to write code that looks synchronous but actually is dealing with um, um asynchronous events uh, Faith says there are two web frameworks in CL that do this, but the continuation support had to be added to CL using a code walker. That's uh, nasty. Uh, but yeah, continuations, <clears throat> excuse me. That's probably the first thing I'm going to try to do uh, with uh, my language mesh is try to implement continuations because I feel like it gives me a lot of capabilities for things I want to do with, with the language. So uh, We'll, we'll be looking into that. I've been reading this book, uh, Lisp in Small Pieces, and it does explain how continuations are implemented, and it's pretty interesting. If you don't know about that book, uh, Lisp in Small Pieces, excellent book. Um, does talk a lot about the differences between Scheme and Common Lisp, which is great. Uh, I think it's mostly from a Scheme perspective, the things that are described in the book, but it does show you how things are done in Common Lisp as well. I'm reading it on Kindle, so it's, it's definitely possible to read that on a phone or a tablet. Uh, which I do. Uh, Rostislav says, your OS does continuation every hardware interrupt or any other interrupt. That's true. 
Yes, as, as usual in the Lisp uh, community, uh, Lisp in small pieces is a recursive uh, acronym, which stands for Lisp. Um, okay, so we got through pretty much everything I wanted to talk about. Hopefully that was useful. Um, I know it probably wasn't super organized, but I think we talked about a lot of interesting things. I will copy this uh, guile.scm file that we wrote while we went through this. Come on now. There we go. And uh, I'll put this in the show notes so that uh, <clears throat> anybody who wants to go back later and take a look at this can, uh, can just copy and paste it. Yeah, Lisp and Small Pieces is, is definitely a brilliant book. Very, very uh, good breakdown of the implementation details of a lot of things in Lisps. A um, lot, of, lot of really good perspective. The, the person who wrote the book has been doing programming language research forever and uh, knows a lot of stuff. Um, so let's see. Uh, like I said... Uh, next week, I'm going to be doing some extra te uh, sort of experimental streams. So if you are uh, on this side of the planet, meaning, you know, in, you know, Europe or anywhere that's sort of surrounding Europe, then probably it will be a somewhat convenient time for you. If you're not in Europe, it probably won't be super convenient. And I'm sorry about that. But all the result of what we will be doing in these streams will eventually turn into videos. So uh, you won't really miss it too much. And uh, Fade and Judy Dev are talking about uh, the... Uh, Art of the Meta Object Protocol. Uh, crafting Interpreters is excellent. I wrote my language based on what I was reading in Crafting Interpreters. Um, and uh, yeah, also, <clears throat> excuse me, don't forget about the uh, Mastering Emacs book. I have a link in the description and in the chat and in the show notes if you want to click on that to, to help out the channel. Uh, it has an affiliate link there. Um, and yeah, I think that's all for today. Thanks to everybody for being here. I really appreciate you. Uh, uh, being here and providing your, your your input and your discussion. Thanks a lot for uh, Russ's law for the 10 euro in uh, Super Chat. I really appreciate it. So um, until next time, I hope you all have a great weekend and happy hacking. See ya. Thanks, Dave.